Thank you, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, ma'am, and thanks, uh, my pal, sir, and uh, AIOS for this opportunity. My talk is on uh, advanced metrics and imaging to evaluate refractive outcome. Uh, these are my financial interests. I do receive grants uh, for some of the works uh, on size uh, uh, research. Uh, when you look at a cornea like this, there are various things which go into understanding the corneal dynamics, and all of them have an important role in playing how the refractive surgery work, the work, the epithelium, the nerves. It was a brilliant talk, uh, Professor Jod. I think uh, I'm going to take some slides from my work. It's also something similar. Both of us share the love for confocal microscopy and uh, the how the ocular surface diseases. So in the advanced format, I divided it into three formats, uh, three divisions, basically epithelium, confocal, and the tear film metrics. Uh, very nicely explained and beautiful presentation on uh, nerves have already been done, how the nerves innovate. Basically, what I'm trying to create is uh, the last few uh, close to a year, we call it as a Nirvana study. This whole thing is about how nerves impact refractive surgery, vision, abrasion, and neuroregeneration neuro and adaptation. Basically, each and every word is important in refractive surgery including how you adapt to a new environment. So this is something which I'm going to discuss today. Uh, this is what an uh, optics of a tear film is. Uh, it's optical scatter, something like, uh, like your abrometer, the point spread function of your abrometer. And you can see that with the dry eye and without a, with the dry eye, and you can see the, how much the scatter is. So it gives you the entire time, your tear film from the first blink to the last blink, how the tear film is, and you can see that anything which is stable here in this means that your tear film is stable. This is a classic problem with refractive surgery, which all of us to be aware of what happens to your tear film when it breaks. And this is a break which you feel in, and you can see that vision drop is significant compared to this here. So it means that these patients may have a very perfect ablation, swell centration, but your scatter and light could be coming from here. And this, this applies both in refractive surgery and as well as uh, in multifocal IOs. And this is something which is not the domain of my talk, but what I want to say is a poor tear film actually causes a very poor depth of focus. Because what happens is when you have a tear film which is breaking, it's very difficult for your accommodation to sustain. So there's always some amount of uh, accommodative uh, lag or accommodative excess which happens, which creates a depth of focus issue. So a tear film like this could have a different depth of focus compared to this. So when George mentioned about nerves and quality and, the, and your T-buds and shermers, it's just about having not only a good ocular surface, it's about having a fantastic depth of focus. And this is something I think as ocular surface specialists, we should understand when your tear film breaks, the eye focusing, refocusing changes a lot. Uh, he's mentioned about the nerves, but I'm going to talk about not the nerves here, all these dendritic cells and the microneuromas. You don't really pick them up. These are all patients who are coming with contact lens intolerance who are not happy with the surgery, with, with their contact lenses. So when you actually do a surgery on a perfect nerve, and this is what you get, the patient is comfortable, post-op, happy person, and your, your quality of life is perfect because everything is good. Now let's look at when you do a laser, a flat-based surgery on these patients. These are all unhealthy nerves. You end up with more inflammation. The epithelium irregularity is more. Molecular tear film is bad. And this is what happens. They're never happy and the quality of life suffers. And this is why it is very important just what George mentioned, how do, you, how do you protect your nerves? Let me look at these two pictures. There are patient one, two, and three, the three different types of patients. And this is a good ocular surface, moderate, and this is something which is not good. I can see the nerves, inflammation. You can see the difference between this and this on the corneal nerves. Let's look at these two patients. One underwent a flap, on other one underwent a smile. I mean, we did not really divide them, randomize them. It was just at that point of time, it was not a, not a study where we would uh, intervene and change the procedures. 
This was the pre-op epithelium. If you have a bad ocular surface, your epithelium is unhealthy and you do a surgery and the regeneration is extremely poor. This is what I, what George mentioned about it. Look at the regeneration in a patient who had very poor ocular surface, a lot of nerves. And here it is slower, but over time, maybe a year, year and a half, two, it starts regenerating. The nerves are slender. It's not as thick as what it was pre-op. And what is important here is the hemostasis between an epithelium and the nerves. If the nerves are unhealthy, so is your epithelium. And you can see that this is why SMILE has a different uh, feature. It's just not preserving nerves. It's not about dry eye. When I say advanced metrics, you look at nerves and epithelium as a complex because the nerves maintain the hemostasis of an epithelium. And if you have a perfect epithelium, if you have a perfect nerves, you have a perfect epithelium. And a perfect epithelium gives a good tear film. And, and you can see the difference between the tear film of this versus this. And the most important thing is you end up in very healthy, very happy patients. And uh, this is what happened. This is what we see. These kind of nerves is what we see in more than 22% of our patients. And we do not really put in efforts. A poor myobomin glands is again a factor. So when you do, when you take this patient for a LASIK, you may get 66, you may get 20-20 vision, but you're never going to get the quality of vision what you want because it is affected by your tear film, the epithelium and multiple factors. The second important thing is the topography itself. We all used to a certain set of sign flug imaging, but now what I feel is in the modern era of refractive surgery, one of the topographers, OCT-based topographer, I'm very, very passionately uh, loving it is your, uh, the MS-39. It gives you epithelium, it gives you epithelium, it's it anterior stroma and it gives you at the bombings. And that is the beauty of it because you're actually virtually subtracting the epithelium. Look at this. This looks suspicious on a pentacam. You, all your indices are normal, but this is actually an epithelial change and your anterior elevation, but in your Bowman's it's normal. And your epithelium, it gives you an epithelial cylinder of around 0.4 diopters of cylinder is coming from the epithelium. That means this patient's epithelium is inducing a 0.4 diopter. And if you are treating this on your topo guided contour are one of them, you have a lot of issues because epithelium would change post-surgery. Exactly the same thing. This looks suspicious, but your indices are normal. And you see that exactly at the same point, you see an epithelial change. Anterior elevation is there, which matches with your pentacam, but your stroma is normal. That's because this, this is coming from the Bowman's layer. And this patient again has close to your points, four diopters of epithelial change. So it's very important to understand the connection between the nerves and epithelium. And this is very important. That is why even though this patient has an abnormal looking topography, your indices are completely normal because the cornea is strong. It's not a weaker eye. And this is uh, in keratoconus, uh, just an example of how much the cylinder can compensate from the epithelium. We spoke about the Bowman's. Bowman's layer imaging is very important. There were not many tools. This was something which we published about in the beginning stage, how you can have a Bowman's sprinkle. But the modern day OCT can pick up your magnified view of your wrinkles in your Bowman's and that can translate to your quality of vision. And this can translate your quality of vision. So in the advanced metrics, you can even pick up your early Bowman's sprinkle and this has a huge impact into your quality of vision. Coming to the biomechanics, there are new indices called SSI indices, indices which looks at a completely independent of your thickness and pretty independent of your IOP. And uh, this is important is that it's independent of your PACI and IOP. This is from the Corvus. Uh, we use this method and uh, we use some prediction methods now. And this is something which is important is we want to come out with a software which is already ready where you can feed in your data and it will tell you which of the procedures will actually give you what type of uh, biomechanical change. And we should be launching it shortly. This is a uh, software where, you know, before you do a surgery, you can fill in your pentacam data and your Corvus data. It gives, does its own modeling mm -hmm. and tells you if you do a PRK, it gives you this much weakness. And this is important because you can choose between procedures. The question always come is uh, in SMILE, we always talk about SMILE Extra, does it work? And we started looking at using polarization sensitive OCT to image the collagen and uh, we have mentioned about this. This is how a collagen looks. 
And you can see that when you have this area switch, loss of signals are something which is uh, when it's weaker. Let's look at these patients who are suspicious. And uh, you can see that this collagen is much normal compared to here, where you have a loss of signal and this matches with what you see inferiorly here. So this picks up early changes in your collagen but also helps us to understand what happens when you do on this patient who has a corneal weakness. And you can see that smile extra actually makes it look more like a normal collagen compared to, you know, some compared to uh, what you, what you'd see if you're just done without a smile extra. So, and also some new indices like SSI looks at whether the cornea is becoming stiffer or weaker. This is just the, some images about uh, the changes here. Uh, what are the future? Future directions are about looking at uh, newer molecules, looking, comparing the imaging and trying to see what new molecules you can find out from your tissues. And what we've been doing is we're collecting every lenticule, but we're imaging it with uh, the polarizing sensitivity so that we match what you see with your molecular signatures. And sometimes it matches, sometimes your collagen matches to what you see here. Sometimes it does not match. So these are all the future advanced direction in which we are looking in the smile. And, uh, and, and these factors will probably one day be part of our system. And uh, I'll just skip these two slides because it's the same slides. Uh, why is it important is because uh, uh, we're looking at a lot of diseases are getting into gene therapies. Today we are doing a smile extra. Tomorrow we might have a system where you can enhance the collagen by itself, this is what we had uh, shown a few years back, but this is the first uh, image of a mouse. Uh, we did it in the COVID time. This is an animal imaging lab uh, where it was very, we did a, a early gene therapy using drops on the mouse model. And we just got what very exciting results on it. It is just using a drops here. So future of imaging is mix of uh, very advanced uh, tools. We look at uh, the confocal microscopy, epithelial mapping, new imaging to look at the collagen itself, and you have to combine it with molecular signatures. And finally, the predicting model, which is a software base, which looks at multiple, uh, multiple aspects of a disease. So uh, my topic was advanced um, imaging. So I use all that which I can find in advanced prospect. What is interesting is the time is very fast. What is advanced today? What is uh, very advanced today becomes very ordinary tomorrow because time moves fast. Everything catches up very fast. These technologies without our knowledge will be in our clinics very shortly. Thank you.